Welcome to the Studio Talk podcast. I'm Xiomara Sosa, your co-host. Every week, we speak to our community members to teach them about mental health through education and awareness, and our hope is to inspire them through social change advocacy. We also interview community members and other mental health professionals, clinicians, healers, students, and wellness professionals. Our style is storytelling. Everyone has a mental health story to tell. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional and is not a substitute for psychological diagnosis or treatment. It's purely educational and purely social change advocacy. If you find yourself in any sort of mental health emergency or distress, please dial 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. Hi everyone, this is Victoria and you are listening to Studio Talk episode 5, Signs That You Are With The Right Therapist. So Ziomara and I today are going to get into a lot about the relationship between therapist and client, why it's important that that relationship is a good one. Um, and what it looks like to have a good relationship with your therapist. Um, So whether you are currently in therapy or you are looking for a new therapist or just getting started, we're going to talk about what to look for. Yes, exactly. Um, Hi, everyone. This is Yamada, your co-host. So I guess we can dive right into it. Um, One one point I do want to make before we get started is, even though we're going to be discussing what are the signs um, that you have a a um, a good therapist and a good relationship with your therapist. This does not necessarily mean that it's going to be easy, or mm-hmm. that your therapist is going to make therapy and counseling mm-hmm. easy for you and make you feel all warm and fuzzy all the time. And that that's the point <laughs> because that's not what we're talking about. Because a lot of times, the good therapists really make it. <laughs> they don't make it, but their job is to challenge us, right, mm-hmm. and to make sure that we're not just going in there to sort of get our our you know ego stroked or anything like that um so that's clear so yeah you're definitely not paying someone just to tell you the things that you want to hear that's not what therapy is no that's not what we're here for um no no so i think what we're first going to get started with is before you even actually meet with your therapist like what are you looking for um, on their websites, you know, we talked a little bit on episode two, I think yeah. about getting started in therapy. Uh, we mentioned, you know, psychology today, looking online, talking to friends and family, all that kind of stuff. Um, but not every therapist is the right match for every person. So mm-hmm. if your best friend goes to a therapist and they love him or her, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that your friend's therapist is the right therapist for you. Right. Yeah. Um, Definitely. And I, I, you know, there used to be a time when you couldn't really go on somebody's website and look at everything that there is to know about the counselor, or the therapist, you sort of just kind of knew their name and where they were. And you went and you had a consultation and you went in. Now our websites are sort of like our, our brochures, really. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways, that's great, right? Because you can go in there and kind of read and see if you resonate with them. If you don't resonate with them, things to that effect. On the other hand, (laughs) because that exists, people can also paint paint a picture of themselves Mm -hmm. and present themselves to be, I don't know, along the lines of being the appropriate counselor or therapist for certain populations, for example. And even though their hearts are in the right place and their minds are in the right place, you know, for it, they may not necessarily be the right counselor for that population. And like, as an example, you know, there's a, and I'll just use the LGBT community. If, if you don't have lived experience or you don't necessarily, you want to serve that population, you want to be supportive and you want to be there for them. That's absolutely doable. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not necessarily the same thing as having lived experience. So if there's someone who's looking for someone, if, if there's someone in that community who's looking for a therapist or a counselor that can can be accepting and be affirming of them and doesn't necessarily have to be in that community, then that's fine. That's exactly what their website should say (laughs) so that you know. But if you're very specifically looking, if you're transgender and you're looking for someone who has lived experience, who understands from a different perspective and that's what's on their website, then you should have the option to think about which of the two is going to be a best fit for you depending on where you are on your journey. Um, So they might 
there's no guarantee that either one of them are going to be you know, a good fit. Mm-hmm. But these are the kind of things that, um, you know, with the freedom of, of a website, we can just put so many things up there and you just kind of have to hope that it's all correct. You know? Yeah. And I don't know if most people are as, I don't know if judgmental is the right word mm. for me, but, you know, just seeing a picture of the therapist, yeah. I feel like can also tell you if you feel comfortable. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. Based on their gender, their race, their mm-hmm. age, yeah. um, how approachable they seem in their mm-hmm. picture, you yeah. know, that, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be your basis for picking a therapist, but that yeah. kind of stuff matters, you know, yeah, it does. Um, you know, and we'd be lying if we said that people don't pick us based on what they see some of the times. <laughs> that's just not, I mean, there are people that say that's not true, but I think it does. I think that for me, you know, my practice is pretty much women, women identified and non-binary people. That's the general population that I promote. Um, And so if they look on my website and they see something that (laughs) resembles either of those three communities, they're going to likely feel more comfortable Mm -hmm. in going there than if they see like a 65 year old man. Yeah. You know, like it's just, it just is what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just human nature that we do feel more comfortable Mm -hmm. with people that we Mm -hmm. see ourselves in a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, phone consultations or some therapists do provide in-person consultations. Mm -hmm. That's not as, as common, but I do recommend if you are, if you're wanting to start therapy with a new therapist, ask them for a a consultation because that way you can talk to them for about 15 minutes on the phone and kind of get a vibe from them on the phone and see if, um, you think it's going to be a good person. Yeah. A good fit. Sorry. Yeah. A good fit. And, and, you can also, you know, come prepared with your questions, like mm-hmm. how much experience do you have in dealing with depression? Is that something that you have a lot of experience with? Or is it something that you are trying to help people with, but are kind of on the learning? Like, you, it's okay to ask them these questions, and they should respond honestly. So yeah. I think that, full, I, in full disclosure, I don't do consultations. I used to before, and I stopped doing it only mostly because I limited my hours. So just access to me became kind of hard, but now I'm going back into that. So that is the best. So definitely. Yeah. You can interview therapists. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's perfectly okay after the consultation to say, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) And talk to someone else. Like I, I always tell, one of the things that I always tell my clients when we do the intake is that whole idea of I personally think that you, once you start the first session between the first and the third session, there's a good sense of whether or not it's a good, it's a good fit between you and both of you should know that. And I always tell them that, that it's okay to let me, I would not take it personally and it is not my job to tell them who they're more comfortable with and that I would refer them out, which I am happy to do, um, based on what it is that they would be more comfortable in, you know, who they might they feel they might be more comfortable with. And I'll, and I've done that with you. I've like referred people to you that I didn't think was necessarily a good fit for me or vice versa, you know? So, um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid of that. That's always a good option. So how important is your relationship with your therapist? Mm. It is the most important aspect, I believe of therapy, no matter what kind of therapeutic intervention you're using, no matter what your background is, your education, Mm -hmm. your licensure, yada, yada, yada. The research has shown that the therapeutic relationship between therapist and client is one of the strongest predictors of successful treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's one of the most vulnerable things that you can do anyway is go Mm -hmm. to a counselor or therapist, right? So the kind of relationship and really what we're talking about is rapport. What we're talking about is... um, you know, the trust factor, the comfort zone, everything that makes you feel safe, quote unquote, in the situation with this person so that you're not uncomfortable, at least trying to open up that you feel Mm -hmm. that this individual really does have your best interest at heart. And that's something that you can't fake. Like, Like therapists and counselors cannot fake that no matter how good they are, you know, it's just something you can't fake. You, you, if you, if it doesn't exist, your relationship with that therapist or that therapist relationship with you is really not going to work. Mm-hmm. Not, not, I mean, it's not going to be horrible where you have to run out of their office screaming or anything, but it's not necessarily going to be the thing that's going to get you to turn the corner on that, 
that issue that you want to turn the corner on. So definitely the relationship is one of the biggest deals. Yeah. And that foundation of trust, like you were saying, like that's super important. Trust that you can open up, that you can talk about these really private, vulnerable things in your life that you probably aren't discussing with anyone else. Yeah. You know, that takes a lot of trust um, when you open up to your therapist about those issues. So if you don't trust your therapist, you should probably find a new one. Yeah. You know? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, and, you know, and be kind of careful with that because Mm -hmm. sometimes... We don't trust the person and they haven't done anything necessarily mm-hmm. wrong, you know, or, or, you know, we just don't fit with them. So we don't trust or maybe we don't trust that they get what it is that we're there for. So maybe they haven't done anything necessarily to make us distrust them. But you've kind of come to a realization that this individual really doesn't get what it's like to be blah, blah, blah and mm-hmm. go through blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of coming out in the sessions because they're a little tone deaf or they're a little bit unaware or they're, you know, things that, and you're finding yourself having to share your words a little differently in order for them to. So like, if you're starting to get uncomfortable in that part, like you're schooling your, your counselor or mm-hmm. you're teaching them instead of it being the other way around. And that that's kind of an area of trust that you need to be able to say, well, I just don't trust that they have the ability or that they're there yet with that particular issue necessarily. And maybe it is time for me to consider someone else who might already be there, you know? And Yeah. And that's a good point. Just because you don't find yourself fully trusting your therapist may not mean that they're a bad therapist mm-hmm. or that they're a bad person. Yeah. I have, I have felt from some of my clients that, you know, after, after a few sessions, I can tell they still don't feel very comfortable. Mm-hmm. And so I'll usually ask them, like, you know, I want you to be completely honest on a scale of one to 10. Like, how much, how much do you trust me at this point in therapy? Mm-hmm. And one, t- one time, actually, I asked that question and my client surprised me and said zero. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being honest. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and so I did have that conversation with him. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. if we're really going to get anywhere if you don't trust me. Right. You know, first of all, is there anything I can be doing differently mm-hmm. to make you trust me a little bit more? Um, and if we can't get there, we need to talk about referring you out um, mm-hmm. because this will go nowhere if you're at a, a zero. Yeah. That wasn't even part of the scale. I said one to 10. <laughs> <laughs> God. That took me by such oh, surprise. Oh, God. I, I laughed out loud to his response. And I was like, I'm sorry for laughing. I just was not <coughs> expecting that. Well, you know, he must have trusted you to some extent that he can be fully honest about <laughs> saying no. I don't trust you. Yeah. Like some people would be like, oh, you know, a little. Yeah. <laughs> But no, he was like zero. Oh, just you know, that's interesting. There. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've ever experienced that. But I know that, um, you know, I, I've had some clients that just because they're, you know, they're traumatized or they're in a position where they just don't trust the world. You know, things have happened. I don't trust anybody. Or, mm-hmm. or sad to say, they've had other counselors or other therapists or other providers really traumatize them or really bad experiences with them. So of course they don't trust necessarily the next one. So they're really checking you out to make sure that you don't take them down that road too. So it's taken a little longer to build that rapport, but rapport, 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 you know, you just, it's just, if even for me, when I go to my mental health person, I have to have rapport with them. Mm -hmm. I can't sit there and feel like, you know, we're just like two people sitting to chatting. I have to have some sort of rapport with them. So yeah, good point. How would you define rapport? For me, I feel, and, and I'll talk about my clients in particular because they're, you know, one of the unique populations that I serve and that would be in the Latino community, right? And and this, this is just generally the rule. So for, for them, it's really important, and this is based on our culture, a lot, we really have to come into the room and have a familial, a sense of familiarity. Whereas one of the things that you're taught not to do necessarily in the helping field, in a lot of helping fields, like you, you know, you have to be sort of clinical, you have to be this and that, whatever. With them, that's not going to work. That's part of the whole cultural competency mm-hmm. stuff. They need to come in and feel like, I know you're not my best friend, and and of course, you know, I'm going to make sure my boundaries are there, but I need to be able to do the smiles and be genuine with the smiles and be genuine with with 
colloquialism and be genuine with the way that my body language is and, and inviting them. Oh, you know, like I have to be much more personable yeah. in that situation. And that builds rapport very quickly with that community. There are other communities that come in and they're not comfortable with that. They don't want to be, you know, like, oh, whatever. I don't know you, you know, you just, and that's not important to them. And so I need to read that and be able you know, to, to rein that back and be sure that that's something that they are comfortable with or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in our community, it's like, I always remember my parents having to take them to their doctor's appointments when we were in Miami and, and whatever. And it was like a big social thing, like going to the doc. And if my mom went to a doctor and she felt like this doc, they didn't have little cafecitos out, you know what that is? Little coffees, <laughs> little coffees, cafe con leches and whatever out. And there wasn't like, and it didn't seem like a familial kind of social almost event. She would not go back. She doesn't want a doctor like that. And the majority of her peers would not want to go to people like that. So they looked for people that were more like them. And so I had to find, you know, a better match for her. And of course, I found it in Miami. Um, but it really was shockingly different than it would be, you know, in other spaces for 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 um, you know, for people to go. So that's kind of what I do in, in my office. I kind of feel it out. But I know certain populations require you to be much more personable. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I, I agree with you. And, and genuinely so, because they'll know when you're being fake. Yes. So you brought up, you brought up a lot of good points. I'm trying to figure out like which one <laughs> I want to respond to. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you were talking about creating this environment that your clients feel very comfortable in for you mm -hmm. to build that connection and trust mm -hmm. and make them feel like they can be themselves mm -hmm. is a really, really important aspect of our jobs. And I don't really know how to put that into words. I always just mm. kind of say, like, we create space. Yeah. And that, to me, can look like what your office looks like. It's definitely what your office looks like. It used yeah. to be where you just, they would tell you, just throw a chair and a sofa in there. And just all they want is your attention and your time. No. That's maybe once upon a time. But mm -hmm. right now, especially with women, I, I deal with women and women-identified people. They come into my space, and they're expecting a certain feel, a certain environment. And when they come in here, that's what I try to give them. And there's a reflection of them on my walls. <laughs> like everything in my office sort of speaks to who they are. Yeah. So, and, and I feel that way about veterans. I also, I'm a veteran and, and veterans on my population as well. And when they come in, <clears throat> there's just something about if you have something that's military related or, or veteran related, even if you don't talk about it and that's not what they want to talk about, that they can relate to and that they get that you get, you know, like you kind of get each other, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But it just, it needs to reflect them. And when I worked for a group practice once upon a time, um, and, you know, we didn't really, I didn't really have a designated office necessarily. And then the pop, the groups that, the population that I served was the Latino community, and veterans and LGBTQ. And there was nothing in the offices that, nothing, in the office, any office mm -hmm. that reflected in any kind of way anything that showed them, you know, like show, but there was for other, you know, like, mm -hmm. like other people could come in and you can just see that, okay, all these. So, and I remember making a big deal about, and I had, you know, a great supervisor that was really very supportive about this, but like just to even have like a little flag up or a little this up or a little whatever up or a sign in, in Spanish and English that said, you are welcome here or whatever, you know, like yeah. made the biggest difference. So I would carry my little things like from office to office, whichever office it was that they assigned to me for that day, I would have those little things that would send the message, you know, that you're mm -hmm. welcome here, we reflect you. And to me, it made a difference. You know, I could see the difference. That's huge. Yeah. Because you know, you're creating that space for a certain population that mm -hmm. doesn't always feel like they do have space. Yeah. You know, so I do think that what is in your office is really important. Yeah. And also creating it to feel like comforting yeah. and warm and whether you have like music or lavender, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to create a space that is is very warm, welcoming, and safe. And comfortable. And comfortable. Yeah, I yeah. definitely do that. One thing I do make a point of, um, like when I have intakes, is I always make a point of saying, you know, if the music bothers you, if the aromatherapy is a thing, and some people with sensory issues, you know, like mm -hmm. if the lighting is an issue or whatever, because I, I used to have a child who was a client of mine back in another, another life, 
and she would come in and turn all the lights on. <laughs> like she would be like, turn on the lights, and she would just turn everything on, turn everything on, because it just bu- bugged her yeah. that the room was just so quiet and so still. It's so, you know. And so now I knew when I had her, I better turn on all these lights and you know turn off the music and just be <laughs> bright and cheery for her. Um, it was a big deal for her, but. But generally, you know, you get a feel for what your clients are looking for. And definitely comfort is one of those things. I I used to go to a counselor, a therapist at the VA once upon a time when they had no room anymore. (laughs) It was just so overcrowded with people needing their services. And one of the rooms that they had to do therapy in was the most uncomfortable. It was just an uncomfortable chair, a gray environment. And you knew the counselor therapist was just so just not wanting to she didn't like it either you know and but it just really it really did affect how comfortable I felt in having a whole hour session in there I would just rush right through it just rush right through it to get Mm -hmm. out because I was so uncomfortable yeah yeah so moral of the story you should feel comfortable (laughs) yeah comfort your sessions with your therapist comfort is important (laughs) exactly um, and I think, you know, besides the kind of like what seems to be superficial stuff, one, one big deal about feeling like you can trust or you are in, are in an environment that's pretty much safe to talk about your most intimate, you know, vulnerable things is confidentiality. One of the things that your counselor should really explain to you the very first time that you have a session is confidentiality and disclosure. I mean, that has to be so clear, you know, that anything and everything that's said is, you know, confidential and what the exceptions are, which are, you know, three or four, I think that I can think of whether mm-hmm. you're going to harm yourself or harm someone else and et cetera. Um, but you know, and ma- being mandated reporters and what that's all about so that you don't catch them off guard, but that they understand what that confidentiality entails mm-hmm. and how committed you are to it. You know? So if someone discloses something to you, are they going to feel like you're going to immediately run to the phone and like as soon as they leave the office and like report them or whatever, or are they going to feel like you're going to help them deal with and work through, which, you know, is always a, you know, you have to think about your liability and you have to think about other people's liability and all that. But, but confidentiality, man, creates that rapport, creates that, that sense of safety. Yeah, and it is important that your therapist explains to you what those limits of confidentiality are. And if you have any questions, ask them. You know, I've had a couple of um, clients in the past, specifically uh, teenagers, Mm -hmm. like, are you going to report this if I say this to you? And usually it's something very small and like it's not reportable or yeah, yeah, it's not. Um, So if you are questioning something, definitely ask or, you know, Sometimes I like to over explain about self harm. Yeah. Because some people think if I tell my therapist I'm even thinking about mm-hmm. hurting myself, mm-hmm. she's immediately going to call 911. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. going to like handcuff me to the chair until, you know, mm-hmm. they don't get me. <laughs> They're going to lock me up for the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is not true. If you are having thoughts of self harm, you, you should, if you feel comfortable, mm-hmm. talk to your therapist about it. Yeah. Um, the only time that, we actually have to break confidentiality as if we think there is a, a serious possibility yeah. that you are going to hurt yourself. Or someone else. And or there's a lethality. You. And also if there's, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about if say someone's having homicidal tendencies and we're talking about it and, you know, dealing with it or whatever, but it's a whole nother thing when they come in and they have the list and the date and the means and the ways and mm-hmm, the people mm-hmm. in it. And you're talking, and t- I mean, at some point you really, they need to understand that you need to take their safety and the safety of others and your own safety as a priority and breaking confidentiality is probably going to be the way to go in order to do that. So mm-hmm. if, if you're, 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 your provider should be very clear and comfortable. That shouldn't be something that they're withholding from you (laughs) so that you're not scared, you know, of going in there and talking about it and always ask questions. I'm telling you, ask questions. Yes. What? What? Because when nobody asks me questions, I ask them, do you have any questions for me? Are you sure you want to think about that? Think about it a little bit more Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm because usually there's a little question in there and then it comes out, you know, so don't be afraid to. And we talk about the same things like a lot. And sometimes I feel like that makes us feel that it's common knowledge. Oh, I know. know, Like, oh, everyone knows what confidentiality is or everyone knows like the limits to it. And so sometimes for me personally, I forget to 
go into like all the details and everything like Mm -hmm. that. So if you do have questions about something, feel free to ask. And if you ask a question and you feel judged from the therapist, that's not a That's a red flag. (laughs) That's a red flag. Should never feel judged (laughs) or or like someone's trying to penalize you or someone's trying. No. no. Yeah. And this podcast is, I'm trying my best to focus on the green flags (laughs) um, really hard, but I do want to have another episode about the red flags. Yeah, the red flags. So. Um, well, definitely. I think that, you know, green flags, we'll talk about these. These are great. <laughs> no, you're right here. I mean, if they're not pushing their agenda on you, you mm-hmm, know, and that mm-hmm. that's a real important one, because, you know, in my position for in my situation, for example, because I do do multiculturalism and I do do, you know, cultural competency and all that kind of stuff. I really have a huge diversity, you know, that comes in or that reaches out to me about certain issues and their issues are usually not their whatever it is that makes them diverse and like it's not their culture it's not the fact that they're lgbtq like that's not why they're in therapy they're in therapy because they have some other thing going on that has nothing to do with it right so when they come in i wouldn't want to put like they're not looking for me to push my agenda about what they should be doing and not should be doing and thinking about and not thinking about when they're coming in to talk about a particular issue. Or if I believe in a certain belief system because of my religious beliefs, not my job to sit there and push that on them. Not my job at all, not anybody's job at all. So I think that that is important that clients be aware of, that the Mm -hmm. agenda is supposed to be your agenda and our job is to make sure that we navigate and facilitate everything in a way that's gonna serve that you know, and not our own agenda. Yeah, I love the word navigate yeah. because that's what we're here to do. We're here to yeah. navigate and we're here to guide mm-hmm. and we're here to work with you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's your goals for therapy, mm-hmm. not necessarily our goals. Mm-hmm. I do think there are times where a therapist will notice something that maybe we could work on that yeah. you may not have noticed as the client. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be okay to have a conversation with. But if you come into like the first session, you're like, yeah. hey, I really want to work on this. Yeah. And your therapist is like, nah, that's, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. You know, let's, let's work on this. I think you need to look at that instead. Yeah. Only that. And that's what we need to put our, like, no, that's not how it works, people. Yeah. So, and I think that a lot of people may have experienced that. I know mm-hmm. some clients that have experienced that and you know, when, when conversion therapy was a thing, Oh my God! Yeah. you know, and people that would, what that would do to them would just be problematic. And then of course, coming in to see other counselors and that they're going to think that the person is doing the same thing, pushing mm-hmm. conversion therapy. If you're not aware, conversion therapy is just, it's not anything that's sanctioned by the mental health profession <laughs> at all, but it's, it's not, and I don't know why they call it therapy because it's not therapy, but it's basically converting. If you if you think you're anything other than straight heterosexual, then they're going to try to convert you. It's usually religious based or, you know, comes from that kind of thinking, but this is a whole programming that they do and a whole lots of stuff that they do. And it's just been proven that it's caused a lot more damage than anything. So, um, we don't practice it. We don't promote it. We don't any of it. Um, That doesn't mean that if someone's struggling with the fact that they think they might be anything other than, you know, heterosexual, but they are uncomfortable and don't want to be that, that doesn't mean that they can't come in and talk about that. That's Mm -hmm. still something that can very objectively be be discussed and processed in counseling without conversion. (laughs) Like, conversion is just not necessary. But anyway, if someone's pushing that, that's an example of, you know, no good. But... um, feeling as if your counselor or your therapist is not judging you and is willing to learn being open-minded about things that maybe they're not necessarily aware of like all the acronyms involved in the lgbt Mm -hmm. community you know it's hard to stay keep up with if they don't really understand what the 2s is which is like the new thing right two spirit and um they're not aware and they're not sure and this is what you're coming in to talk about then it's okay to explain and talk and, you know, Mm -hmm. they, your counselor shouldn't be acting like they know what it is and then sneaking off and looking into what it is on their phone, Googling it and then coming back like they're the expert on it now. No, they should be able to say, I'm not really sure what that is. Is that something that, you know, you can tell me about or talk to me about and maybe there's something I can help you with in that area and it can still be helpful. Yeah. There's definitely been quite a few times in my sessions where I've said, 
I don't really know what that means. Mm-hmm. Could you please explain it to yeah. me? Especially anything like medical related. Yeah. You know, they'll go into their careers and talking about different things. Yeah. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking <laughs> I about. I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's really important. Um, the whole decision thing. I think I think that there's this this question about go to a counselor or therapist, they will give you advice and tell you what you need to do with that situation. That is not what counselors and therapists do. Mm-hmm. They do not give advice, do not, do not tell you what to do. Yeah. I have a lot of opinions on that. Though. Yeah, yeah. They're, you, they have to be very skilled, even if that is the road that they take, have to be very skilled in how, like, it's really supposed to be empowering the client to make mm-hmm. those decisions, helping them consider everything involved and giving thought to anything and everything that needs to be thought and then them coming to that conclusion of what they need to do or how they need to do it now if they need resources and support Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing then that's our job to sort of be that person and help them consider all these things is not our job to say you need to leave your husband (laughs) you know or yeah you know you need to leave your family or you need to stop talking to your you know like you really that's not our job No, it's not. And there are definitely times where I have been in sessions with specifically clients who are just in really, really Mm -hmm. not great relationships. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've abusive. Yeah. I've Mm talked, I've talked to you about this, Mm -hmm. how I really struggle with not being like, Mm -hmm. what are you doing? Get out of this relationship right now. That's not my decision to make, you know? And so we're not keeping secrets from our clients that we know all the answers and we know what you should do mm-hmm. and we're just keeping it from you. I mean, not only is it really not our place to be telling you what to be doing with big decisions like your mm-hmm. career, your relationship, all these kind of stuff. Your health. Your health. We don't we ultimately don't know. You know, yeah. we don't know what the right decision for you to make. You do, and it's our go- our job to kind of try to guide you to be able to figure out mm-hmm. what that decision is for right. yourself, yeah. you know. Not to flat out tell you, well, I think you should just get a divorce. That's really yeah, what it sounds yeah, yeah. like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I remember you 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 coming and talking about that. And one of the things you know we talked about was the lethality of it. Like you know, mm-hmm. it's real easy to say, and it's very timing because right now is when the whole Amber Heard and, and Johnny yeah. Depp thing is going on and everything. And but you know, it's it's the lethality, and we talked about that. Is like. You know, it does take the statistics, like I said, was it takes up to the seventh time. And usually the seventh time is the most lethal for the person that's trying to leave. And so there has to be accountability for how leaving and when you leave and how you leave and all of those kinds of things take place. So we have to be really careful that we don't try to push something on them that we think they need to do because we don't know if that's going to be the safer thing for them. We don't know if in the end... We don't know. We can only sit there and do psychoeducation, do, you know, guide them and and prepare them and do for whatever it is that they decide. So if anyone is pushing on you what you need to do and what you don't need to do, that's definitely something to think about. Yeah. I mean, I'll give a personal example, actually, is I, let's see, how much do I want to (laughs) self-disclose? I have an avoidant attachment style, which we can get into attachment styles yeah. a different time, but essentially that means I have a little bit of a fear of commitment mm-hmm. and, you know, being very um, open and close to who I'm in a relationship with. I always put a wall up, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was having some doubts in my relationship um, and I decided to go to therapy to explore mm-hmm. those doubts. And the first therapist that I went to basically told me well since you're having doubts it's probably not the right person wow i also have struggled with ocd which we'll get into it another Mm -hmm. time and one um subtype of ocd is called relationship ocd Mm -hmm. which is where you obsess over having doubts in your relationship Mm -hmm. so with that and an avoidant attachment you know it gets really confusing and for Mm -hmm. someone to actually sit there and say you should just end this. Like, what are you doing? <gasps> wow. Did not help my confusion. Yeah. At all. <laughs> In fact, it made me 10 <clears throat> times more anxious. Right, right. And so instead of just having her kind of sit there and explore with me and provide a space for me to just process what's mm-hmm. going on with me, mm-hmm. she immediately just kind of jumped to, yeah. this is not right. And even like, even hold a mirror up to something that may not be re- really what's going on, but you somehow think that's what's going on and maybe holding mm-hmm. that mirror up and saying, you know, maybe these other things are something for you to consider, but to 
flat out say, no, no, that's really dangerous. It is. It can be. So yeah. green, green flag, green flag. Is <laughs> your therapist is not telling you what to do right. with these big decisions yeah. in your life or I really they're really not supposed to tell you what to do with hardly no, any decisions. No, to be I mean, I think bringing options up and and asking what if and da da and things to that effect, but not not right out telling you, you know, you need to do yeah. this, you need to do that. That's just what the hell. If she would have reframed that to how would it make you feel if you left this person, mm-hmm. I would have responded with really anxious and upset mm-hmm. and heartbroken. Yeah. And then she could have been like, okay, let's explore that more, mm-hmm. you know, because it's. It, it's just not good. So It's not good. And then also, how do you know that is the right, like, you don't, you just don't know that that's the right thing because that's why we don't go to friends and family for relationship advice. Yes. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I harp on that. It's like, you should, when it comes to your family and your significant other, you can't go to your family and your significant other for advice about your family and your significant other because it is so subjective. Mm-hmm. It's also coming from a very personal they see one side, they know one side, and they want to help you. They don't want you to be in pain or anything or suffering, but, you know, they likely don't know everything. They don't know everything that's going, you know. Of course, safety is the most important thing. So, of course, when there's domestic violence and things like that, and safety issues and all that, you know, abuse, that's a whole other story. But, but you know, relationship problems, when, when people, you know, give advice like that, and it's just, wow. So that's why I have issues with, programs on radios and whatever where people call in with like a problem oh, yeah. and then you have like non-relationship people giving advice about your relationship situation and then that person will go home and do that and you don't know what in the hell you just did you don't yeah. know what kind of can of worms you just opened up but you're popular on the radio and saying what you should be doing you know in your relationship because i did that and then they these people do it and wow yeah, be careful. <laughs> it can certainly be damaging. Yeah. Um, um, and so there's that. And then let's talk about diagnosing a little bit. Okay. Because I think a lot of people um, going, whether or not it's a good fit or not a good fit, it's, you know, in our situation, we don't necessarily have to diagnose because as we've mentioned, I think it was episode one, um, we, we're private pay, so we don't have to diagnose in order um you know, to be paid, like most people do when they're dealing with insurances or Medicaid or Medicare and things to that effect. That doesn't mean we don't diagnose. That doesn't mean we have to or we shouldn't. It just means that we're a little bit more able to give some thought (laughs) to where we're going in that direction, because not everybody requires a diagnosis. Um, But if you do need a diagnosis, like counselors that don't diagnose you right away are my best friends. Like they really are my best friends, because <clears throat> well, they may not be my best friends, but I really like them, <laughs> you know, because you can be coming in and presenting with anything and everything that looks like, I don't know, major depressive disorder, right? Could look like major depression, clinical depression, anything in that, you know, to that effect. And then three sessions later, those things will be resolved because you really didn't have a diagnosable depressive disorder. Yeah. But you yeah. were having symptoms that resembled or looked like, you know, so if they're not diagnosing you right away, if they're not, some people want to get diagnosed right away. You know, more power to you if that's what you're looking for and that's between you and your, your mental health provider. But I think a good green flag is that your counselor and your therapist isn't so eager Mm-hmm. To put a label on you right away without having a significant amount of sessions with you or appropriate assessment or appropriate discussions to really get all of the clutter out of the way and get to a clearer perspective on what could potentially be a diagnosis and then the treatment plan for that. So I yeah. like counselors that do that. Or not trying to put you in this box of a diagnosis, yeah. you know, where they're like... Um, almost suggesting symptoms yeah. to make you fit that yeah. diagnosis. That can yeah. be. Yeah. Cause you're treating a person, not a diagnosis. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we have to be really careful with that. And mm-hmm. I think that, um, and again, we talked about why that's tricky with insurance and Medicaid and Medicare and all that stuff. Sometimes you can't have another session unless you do have a diagnosis, mm-hmm. you know? So, so anyway, so there's that. Um, <clears throat> so talking about, Friendship and yeah. therapist. This is a big one for me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> this is a really big one for me. Your counselor and your therapist is not your friend. Mm-hmm. Your friend is not your counselor and your therapist. 
it just doesn't work. Yeah. It's just not the way the therapeutic alliance goes. It's just not appropriate. And it's not in the best interest of the client. It just is not. And it's not necessarily in the best interest of the therapist either. Yeah. Because <clears throat> it does compromise your ability to be objective and do your job the right way. Yes. I would say this is an area that I struggle with, or at least I, I feel nervous about, am I setting strict enough boundaries with my clients? Because I have a very casual approach to therapy. That's part of like my rapport building. Mm -hmm. I want my clients to feel just very, very comfortable. And I'm just kind of a casual Mm -hmm. person as my genuine self. Mm -hmm. And so there are times where I'm like, especially clients I've been seeing for like a year, you know, eventually you're like, okay, is this too casual? Am I acting like more of a friend than a therapist? And I think that's where boundaries come in. Yeah, definitely. Right. So we're going to talk about all the healthy boundaries that your therapist should have with you. Yeah. I think the number one obvious boundary, or maybe not obvious, the number one boundary is that there really should not be a, a lot of communication outside of sessions. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, that you is correct. You should not be texting them all the time. You should not be, you know, emailing, calling. You should not be hanging out no. ever, ever, ever outside yeah. of sessions with your no. therapist. No, and if you see them in public, you don't invite them to your table and, hey, come over here nope. and have dinner with my nope, nope, husband nope. or whatever. Like, I, I you know, I, I really have issues. <laughs> like, I really am very judgy. That's my judginess for the day, for today, for this episode, (laughs) my judginess. No, no, that's not what we need to do. And there's a reason for that. It has, it has a negative impact on your ability to have a therapeutic alliance with this individual that isn't based on your subjective relationship with them. Your relationship with them needs to be professional for a reason. You have a job to do that you're trained to do that's very important that you do it as right as possible. And also, you don't want to enable a person that's in a position that's coming to you for help to be that dependent on you outside of session. Part of what we're doing is supposed to be to empower you to be able to handle things and, you know, get through the things that you need to get through in between sessions and giving you the tools to be able to do that. So if, if we're finding that they're calling us and, th- and, you know, and those boundaries are just loose, you know, and it's just whatever. Yeah, that's, that's an issue. That's, that's and now that's very different than when you're working in crisis counseling. That's a whole nother thing. You know, when you're dealing, I did a lot of crisis counseling before, and that's a little different when, you know, you're dealing with suicidal clients that have been hospitalized and, you know, there are all these big crises or disaster mental health and things like that. Of course, that's different than, you know, there is the outside of the session, outside of, you know, your your time with them on one-on-one that you're available to them, kind of like social workers, you know, and, and do what you need to do to get them to a safe place again and, and that kind of thing. But for it to be like ch- chatting and, oh my God, my husband yeah. just pissed me off. What do I do? And then they're texting you back and saying, oh, just stay calm. Don't, you know, like be careful with that. Be mm-hmm. very, very careful with that. They are not your best friend. They're not your buddy. That's yeah. not, that's, that's not okay. Yeah. And I, I know that therapists have different levels of boundaries for them. You know, you might have a therapist who has zero communication at all in between sessions, yeah. except for maybe scheduling, or maybe that's not even done with them. It's done yeah. with a, a, yeah. a scheduler. And there are other therapists who I think I communicate sometimes with my clients in between sessions. Typically, if a client is having like a crisis, mm-hmm. I always say like, if I'm available, you know, mm-hmm. we can talk on the phone, but usually that happens once every three or four months yeah you know it's not if a client is calling me every week then there's a a boundary conversation Mm -hmm. needs to happen yeah um i feel comfortable with that to an extent and i know that boundary and when i feel it being crossed i do say something yeah like hey let's let's schedule a session yeah you know this is getting to the point where we can't be talking like this yeah i redirect them to i've gotten because for some reason the google put my personal cell phone up on the oh, no. whatever that is the oh my god the business whatever and yeah. then I can't even fix it anyway because every time I try to call them to fix it they send a message I don't know where and if you don't respond oh, to it then geez. they don't think it's you so it's anyway yeah. it's just out there so 
anytime people can get it, there are some people they're very clever like if they can't get you to contact them right away they can't get you right away they'll find that number and they'll call mm-hmm. it and you can tell it's my personal number and they'll still leave messages and things to that effect so I had to change it to say this is my personal number you know don't whatever but now they have your cell and now they have your you know and they're selling they're texting you and they're mm-hmm. it and you have to really be i for me anyway I have gotten to where for their sake and for my sake where I have to be really adamant about that and give them the appropriate number to text and the appropriate number Mm -hmm. to call and then remind them what my hours are, you know, what my hours are. And we need to schedule a time for you to come in to discuss that. We can't, you know, be doing this on, it's not even, I I mean, teletherapy is already something that I'm (laughs) kind of like, I do it because it's necessary and Mm -hmm. it is, does help a lot, but it's not my favorite thing either. I I really like in-person things, so... Definitely, that's a great one, like for boundaries. Yeah, Yeah, so I think sometimes it can be seen um, a little bit backwards. Like if my therapist is not responding to me all the time, then she must not care about me Mm -hmm. and like she's not a good therapist. But really, that's a sign of a good therapist that Mm -hmm. they are setting those boundaries. If you ever have a therapist that is saying like, hey, you know, um, it's not really appropriate to for us to be, you know, texting at one o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. or something like that. And they're really open with you and they are setting those boundaries. That's a really good sign yeah. that you're with a good, responsible, professional therapist. Yeah, so right. don't, don't take it as them not caring. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. I agree. And, you know, and then we also have the misrepresentation, on, you know, from Hollywood and the movies about oh, yeah. people being able to do all these things with their counselors and their counselors, like, going on. And that's really not appropriate. And, and it's not helpful. Believe me, it's not part of the therapeutic process for them to be hanging out with you, mm-hmm. you know, and being part of everything that's going on in your personal life outside a session. Yeah. There are reasons why we set those boundaries, and they are 98% for your benefit as right. the client, you know. so. Right. Speaking of boundaries, I do want to mention physical boundaries really yes. quickly between a therapist and client. Mm-hmm. Um, a green, okay, I'm going to focus on green flags. So <laughs> a green flag would be your therapist does not give you any unwanted yeah. touch yeah. in a session. No touchy touchy. No touching. Um, I mean, my general rule is just no touching. Mm-hmm. I don't touch. I don't do hugs. I don't touch my client during a session, like a hand on the shoulder or if my client is crying, I don't go over and sit next to them and start consoling them. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, that's my boundary because I, I don't think it's comfortable for me. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think it's necessarily appropriate. Mm-hmm. I think I've hugged one client and it was, um, it was a kid and it was mm-hmm. like the end of session mm-hmm. or the end of treatment and she initiated. Yeah. I yeah. think that's important too. Yeah. If your therapist is initiating any type of physical contact. Yeah. You need to get out. Yeah, that's just <laughs> just not, even if it's not intended to be creepy and whatever, it's inappropriate. Yeah. Um, but I do, and like I said, again, some communities, that's sort of like mm-hmm. the norm. So I keep that in mind. But even with that, I'm pretty careful with the whole situation. Just yesterday, I had a new client that came in and was super, she was just super comfortable and super, very happy. She found a good fit, et cetera, et cetera. And on her way out, she was feeling really good, like in a really good place and said to me, is it okay if I hug you? Because yeah. I feel like this has, li- you know, she said very beautiful things before she was leaving. And I was like, if you're comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. And she came okay. over and gave me a hug and I gave her a hug. And then, you know, that was that. Mm-hmm. And she left and whatever. But even when I feel like hugging them and I'm like, oh my God, this is a moment. I don't do it. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. you really have to, be careful with that but I like the fact that she asked you know and then you know and it made it you know but it's not something that should be everyone should be in the habit of doing like you know so be careful with that um but those are definitely green that's a great green flag Mm -hmm. um healthy boundaries and um think about oh what were you gonna say oh I I think we skipped over like the one thing that I did want to say was um and this is a red flag I guess I'm the red flag chick it's hard um, not to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> you know, um, back to the diagnosing thing. One one of the things that I would be oh, yeah. mindful of is when you're talking to your counselor or your therapist and you're talking about your significant other and you're talking about whoever all else there is and they've not met them, they've not talked to them, they don't know them or anything like that and they're offering all kinds of diagnoses, diagnoses <laughs> on them, for example... 
yeah, well, you know, your husband is has narcissistic personality disorder and your mother has, what you know, like mm-hmm. with these like serious mm-hmm. kind of, or it sounds like they have clinical depression. Anything along those lines that they're saying, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't know that other counselors and therapists do that. I'm just saying, in my opinion, I feel very uncomfortable doing that. It's one thing to do, like, what, what did they call it back in school? A uh, diagnostic impression, I think is what it used to be called, where you mm. weren't allowed to do diagnosis, but you were allowed to give your impression or something of what you think it might be or whatever. It's one thing to, like, you know, say, I wonder if... if da, da. But, like, to flat out be telling people that what their sister or their brother or their you know, wife or husband or significant other or child, sounds like, you know, the ADHD is going like, be careful with that, you know, because we don't know. I mean, we don't know even like the infant, we haven't met with those people. We don't sit with them. We don't, haven't done appropriate anything. We can have our ideas and our thoughts, but, and the danger in that is that we understand what what it means when we say that, but we don't know that the client understands or doesn't understand and even if they did this freaking google and everything else Mm -hmm. imagine telling somebody that you think their significant other has narcissistic personality disorder and then they go home and they google it and then they bring it up to them and they say this is what my counselor says that you have you know like that's just so not helpful not helpful at all so i did want to bring that up that counselors and therapists that don't do that even though you want them to (laughs) when Mm -hmm. you come in and you really want them to tell you what's wrong with this person don't the, the green flag is that they don't. Maybe yeah. wanting to see the person and, you know, and talk to them, that's different, but not not based on secondhand info like that. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not there to give treatment to. Yeah, they're not our patient. Or, yeah, yeah, they're not our patient. They're not our so client. So we definitely cannot assume yeah. what we could diagnose them with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that, um, well, well, we'll deal with that at the end of it. Never mind, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Victoria makes a little outline for us to to kind of keep us in somewhat I of feel a like we guide. jump all over the place though. I mean, but it's okay. I'm trying it's to be okay. good and follow it this time. So. You're doing better than me. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the one who creates the outline and then doesn't follow it at all. <laughs> so and like, then lets what? me go all over the place. <laughs> That's not helpful. I'm trying to be really good today and go by there. <laughs> Make sure that we cover these things. Um yeah, okay, so Let's see, what's next on our little life? Well, I think talking about, I do want to talk about like the specific skills that you are wanting to see from your therapist. Yes. Um, Carl Rogers is definitely one of the psychologists that I look up to the most. And he is, he founded client-centered therapy, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and his whole basic premise was unconditional acceptance, unconditional positive regard for your client, no matter what they've done, no matter what they're experiencing, you are fully accepting that person as the human that they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a beautiful foundation of what therapy should, should start with, you know, is allowing your client to feel like they are accepted for who they are. Yeah. Even if they see themselves as, I mean, I hate using this word, but if they see themselves as broken yeah. or if they see themselves as just, you know, a lot of negative self-talk, let them freely express that in session. And, you know, so he has a quote actually that I wanted to share on yeah. this episode. And he says that the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. Mm-hmm. And that has, I need to like, print that up and put it in my office. That's a great thing to have hanging in the office. Yeah, yeah, because I do believe that a a good therapist should make you feel fully accepted for who you are. Yeah. You know, good and bad or what you perceive as good and bad, just everything, you know. And once you get to that level of acceptance, then we can work on what are some things that you'd like to change or improve or work on, you know. What is no longer serving you that we can, can work on? And what's creating the distrust that brought you here in the first place? Like, you know, I mean, even that if that is who you truly are and what you truly believe and feel, if it's causing you distress enough to want to come in and process it, then that's what we'll do when Mm -hmm. you're ready. But I'm not here to say, why do you feel that way? You shouldn't feel that way and make you feel bad about feeling bad. Like, yes, that is not our job. (laughs) You know, aggressively shaking my head back and forth. (laughs) (laughs) That's no good. Yeah. Um, I think you should feel fully accepted for who you are 
from day one until the end of treatment. Yeah, you know? and never like anything is punitive, mm-hmm. you know, like it's really, I've sadly had clients that have, when I worked in different places that requested to be reassigned because of different things. And then they've disclosed that one of the reasons that they did that is because the counselor or therapist was very punitive with them and their child. Well, this isn't working because you're not doing that and you're not doing that. Like it was just very, and I don't know that the therapist or counselor meant to come across that way, but that is certainly the way that the client perceived it, you know, and Mm -hmm. it was not good. You know, it was something that I had to work at undoing in order for me to even be able to get through to that. So that's, it's definitely something to um, be aware of. Yeah, you shouldn't feel like you're going to visit a probation officer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're not here to punish you or criticize you no. or anything like that. We're no. here to just listen and help and accept and... And challenge. And challenge, for sure. Definitely challenge. But and I don't think those two are... Um, What's, what They don't negate each other. Yeah, right? no, I can don't. challenge you, but still accept you for who you are. Right. You know what I mean? I can maybe disagree with this, but still accept you. Mm-hmm. Those those can exist together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and all of this to say that what, what one person considers to be a good therapist and a you know good counselor for them may not be what another person necessarily feels is a good therapist or a good you know counselor. I think the position that we have about the whole about it is more that there are a lot of ethical issues involved in being um, a good counselor and a good therapist, regardless of whether or not we have a rapport that, you know, is favorable or not, regardless of whether or not the therapeutic alliance is there or not, there's still an ethical obligation that we have in doing our job. So for us, any counselor, any therapist needs to make sure that that's at the forefront of everything that they do. So mm-hmm. if they're wanting you to feel better about something and they're breaking some ethic, you know, to do it, like kissing and hugging you or something like that, because that's what it's going to take to make you feel better, then that that's something that's not, that's just not big no-no. You know, yeah. I don't know. You know, don't so, let your therapist kiss you. That's, yeah, yeah, that's just not. <laughs> even flag. if it's coming from the best place possible, it's just, mm, you know, that's, that's uh, anyway. Um, but... What Like for me, I feel like when I go to my counselor or my therapist, like, you know, with the VA or whatever, I need to have a person who knows that I'm also a mental health provider and not allow me to try to take over <laughs> like mm-hmm. that not and try to be, you know, telling her what I think is wrong with me or telling him what I think I need. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I need somebody who understands to be strong enough and to be challenging enough to redirect that a lot and to get that like that's I know that that's what I need that doesn't mean that it's a good therapist or a bad therapist it's just not the appropriate one for me if I Mm -hmm. can go in there and then all of my skills and everything that I learn is in competition with them and we're both trying to kind of like outdo each like I can't and that's happened where I it's just naturally went there and the discussion became that as opposed to what my issue was so Mm -hmm. I learned I learned that you know just because you know we're kind of debating and hanging and chit-chatting that doesn't mean that that was the best person for me i need someone mm-hmm. who can say we're not here for that <laughs> like we're here because you're dealing with your whatever you know and so yeah um yeah so okay so have we talked about the therapeutic alliance enough <laughs> i think so okay think so so definitely guys you know it's different for everybody but at least think about the green flags that we've talked about i think mm-hmm. the green flags are pretty important um, don't let the big red flags go unnoticed either because those are really important. If you're sitting in an office and you have a big red flag come up and you're thinking this is not the right place for me, then definitely pay attention to that. It's important. Yeah. You know, it's and you important. Can, you can leave, you know, you can That's find right. a new therapist. You yeah. don't have to just stick it out because I don't know, this is the person that you you picked first or anything like that you you can leave you know definitely um and i i always have that discussion with mine if it's not a good fit we will work it out or you can definitely you're not obligated i want it to work out but if it doesn't i mean i think one of the last things that we need to talk about i i guess we can talk about is the whole cultural competency Mm -hmm. multicultural stuff um which is a really big deal because, you know, we do have, and I know not everybody's comfortable with this, but it is a reality. We have 
populations and communities that are underserved, that are not served, that are marginalized, that are stereotyped, Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff um, that are going on out there. And everyone, there are a lot of people working really hard to rectify that, to change that, to do what they can about it. And there are a lot of other people who just don't want to and don't care. The thing for me as a counselor and a therapist that I'm a little bit um, careful about is at the beginning of the episode, we talked about how you can go on somebody's website and look for this, that, and the other. One of the things that's happening a lot lately in that, like the LGBT community and Latino community, like we're, they're pushing back a lot about is that suddenly because it's now considered okay, you know, quote unquote, to be out, to be this, to be whatever. And, you know, so we, these populations and these communities can be people that I serve too, because I want to be open-minded or whatever, or they're just, you know, a population that I can tap into or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not judging, just saying that suddenly everybody's comfortable with it, where there used to be a time when that's not something that people were comfortable. They would not those are not the populations of the communities that would be like the ideal, you know, yeah. the ideal. So, and then maybe there's other ish reasons why maybe there were language barriers, so they couldn't be, or maybe they were religious, you know, whatever. What I've noticed a lot lately is that there are people who are like suddenly putting that on their website, you know, like, yes, I serve the LGBT community, or I'm going to just stick with the LGBT community because it, it is just a little bit more obvious. Um, And I know that these individuals have never worked with the LGBT community before. I know they have no relationship with them. I know that they have no lived experience. I know that they just, you know, want to open up their practice to them, which is nothing wrong with it Mm -hmm. in theory, you know. But if this is already a community that by the very nature of our profession, the availability of people who have the skills and the knowledge and the, you know, cultural competency to provide services to that community is already limited to begin with. And it's already difficult for them to find and be comfortable with and all of those kinds of things. And you're looking on a website of a person who's never really, but they're trying to kind of like be the spokesperson for that person. Now it's very different than saying, I will accept any, you know, like if you're LGBT people are welcome, we're affirming here and all that. That is, not what I'm talking about. I think that yeah. that's cool. But when you're when you're presenting yourself as someone who has an extensive amount of the appropriate cultural competency and lived experience and all kinds of stuff in a population that you don't, you really don't, and you want to try to sort of yes do it without doing the work and the consultation with the people who are, mm-hmm. you know, that, then that's problematic for me. Like for me, that's problematic. So don't don't say that you serve the transgender community, for example, but you're doing it because you just have an affinity for them and you want them to have a safe place to be. But you really don't have the skills necessarily, or the understanding, or the background, or the whatever it is Mm -hmm. when they do come in, and then you end up doing harm without realizing that you're doing harm because something as simple as saying yes, non-bi, we accept non-binary people, and then you're using wrong pronouns because you just didn't know what you didn't know but you want that community and you want to be hip now and cool and have, you know, whatever. And you're using wrong pronouns for people who have dysphoria about, you know, like, like it's just one of those things. So I see that a lot now. So if you're in a community where you're already sort of hesitant because this is what you need to be, you need people who are culturally aware, sensitive, all sorts of stuff that understand your plight that, and you're looking for a person that you feel that's going to be in your best interest to deal with your issues and to deal with you as a person. And you find on their website that, oh, they're saying that they are. And then you go to the office and you quickly realize that that is not correct. And believe me, they will realize it. They will know, they will know, you know, they will figure it out. So don't try to pretend and don't try to, it's, it's almost like saying that you can, you're there for the veteran community and you want to do provide services for them and that, but then you have no, uh, no idea Mm -hmm. what combat PTSD really is or what the, 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 the military culture really was like a whatever, but you're open hearted and you want to try and whatever they're going to figure it out. And they're going to be like, this is just another civilian's office. Mm-hmm. And I thank you. I appreciate it, but you just wasted, you know, like now I need to go find someone who, so, so for me, a green flag is someone who says, you know, everyone is welcome here. We will do our whatever, but if we need to refer people out for specific, you know, um, cultural issues or ethnic, you know, anything to that effect, 
that we have the appropriate person <laughs> to do that with and they won't leave you there like all broken. So anyway, the whole cultural competency piece, the multicultural, multicultural counseling skills are very important. If they don't get something and their act, clinicians are acting like they do get it, you know, they do get what it's like. If you're a male and you're pretending to think that you know what it feels like to have sexism in your life in terms of, you know, sexual assault and, and what it's like to maybe lose your job if you don't, you know, and you're acting as if you know what that's like, or you're minimizing it, or you really have no idea, be honest about it, you know, and say, I'm not, I don't. And if you, if you have a counselor that can do that, even if they don't have the lived experience or they don't have the multicultural, you know, or, or cultural competency skills, that's okay. Because at least now, you know, that it's, it's sort of a, a rapport that the two of you are going to work with to handle and deal with that, but it's not coming from a fake and phony place because you're trying to like mm -hmm. <laughs> serve all, you know, yeah. masters and whatever. And so just, that's something I did want to make sure. Yeah. And I've had those conversations with some of my, you know, multicultural clients mm -hmm. for listeners who don't know I'm white. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I have had to say that, or let me be even more specific, I am a white, straight woman. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of, you know, communities that I don't necessarily have shared experiences with, mm -hmm. you know, and I will be very open with them in, in sessions and say, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know what that mm -hmm. feels like, because I don't, you know, and I'm just trying to be genuine and honest with you. Right. And let's explore more about how you feel. And if you can't form that connection with me, then let's, let's transfer out. I mean, one example is I actually, I am, I am tried and true alliance with LGBTQ right. plus population. See, but like that's a saying, perfect word. That's yeah. exactly what the way it should come across. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I am definitely, you know, mm -hmm. in alliance with that, but I do not feel competent specifically treating transgender clients. Mm -hmm. I have such little experience. I have mm -hmm. zero training. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, all the things that you're saying are important for mm -hmm. a clinician to work, especially with a, a, a population mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so if that comes up in sessions, I will be very honest and say, you know, let's talk about maybe transferring you out. And I have connections to mm -hmm. great therapists in the mm -hmm. area. Um, Lisa, if you're listening, yeah. she's, Yo, Lisa. <laughs> she's definitely kind of mm -hmm. my go-to person because mm -hmm. that's what she specializes mm -hmm. in. You know, that doesn't mean that I don't support them at all. It just means that. Exactly. You know, that's that's a difference. great point. Um, that's a great point. Cause I didn't want to come across, like I was saying, how dare they? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm saying. But I think that in there's, although I will say that there are some, mm -mm, call it out that suddenly do have that on their website mm -hmm. and i'm like i think what? you're right i think it's more of just oh, like oh what? look at me i'm accepting yeah I'm and i'm all that and like <laughs> since when when i knew you you were just like you only had like, yeah okay yeah, come on. so yeah so but there are and that's why you're noticing now that people people that are part of these different communities that have really fought hard to make sure that it becomes an inclusive part of you know, mental health and all that kind of stuff, and who have gone on to get their credentials to be able to give services to this community of theirs that didn't have it before, are now putting on our, their websites. I, I have theirs, and it says lived experience. Mm -hmm. And like mine, it says veteran woman owned, like all that, because a lot of people can't say that, mm -hmm. but allow themselves to be perceived as if so that that community can feel that yeah. that's what they are. But really, they're not you're in alliance with and that's a different reality, which doesn't mean anything bad. Mm -hmm. It's just honest and truthful. And that's just all there is to it. You know, like, it's just how it is, you know, and like, if someone is coming and they want Christian counseling, and that's what they're looking for. And that's what they're needing. And they're looking mm -hmm. on websites, and I go and I slap on their Christian counseling that and it's like, and knowing that I don't know, yeah. what in the hell Christian counselors really do, you know, and don't do, and they're trained to do, and they don't, but I'm accepting of you because I am, and I support you because I do, but that doesn't make me, like, the expert that you need to come seek out, <laughs> like, if those are the issues that you're dealing exactly. with. Exactly. But if exactly. you're dealing with domestic violence, or you're dealing with PMDD, or whatever, and you're Christian, you can come to me, because mm -hmm. I'm that girl, you know, but... I don't know. I mean, I just don't want it to sound like we're excluding and including people. So I want to be very careful of, about that. Um, but there are some things that if you start noticing that some people have lived experience put on their thing, that that's really a little message, <laughs> you know, that says it's okay to go to anyone you feel like it, whether or not they have lived experience or not, it's perfectly fine. It's just being aware of, you know, the limit that this individual might have 
as opposed to what somebody else might not have. You know? Exactly. That's all. And that's it. That's my spiel. I think we covered everything that we wanted to cover, even though we were all over the place with this outline. But <laughs> as usual. We got it done. Right. I think maybe something that could be helpful is to just create like a bullet point list of like green flags for a good therapist. Yeah. Um, and maybe putting that in the, the show notes yeah. and I can create that and, and post that for people to see. So okay, cool. you just have kind of a straightforward yeah, that's very green helpful. flags list for what you're looking for. Yeah. Not necessarily to find a good therapist, but to find the right match of a therapist for you specifically. Right. Yeah. You know, right. so. And no guarantees. There are no guarantees. This that's is a true. lot of times it's just hit or miss. A lot of the times it's just going through different people until you find the one that fits um but it's doable and and these are just some some tips on how to make that process a little bit less daunting yeah yeah that's what we're here for and with that we're gonna wrap it up all right thanks everyone (laughs) all right everyone hey everyone victoria here thanks for listening to studio talk we hope you enjoyed our conversation into all things related to mental health as always, you can head over to Studio Talk on YouTube or on Xiomara's website at the x-studio.org, where you can click on the podcast tab on the top menu. Sign up for our email list is there, as well as check out all the links and resources, including Xiomara's website, in the show notes. That's all for this episode, and we hope to see you next time. If you are experiencing any psychological distress, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room.